So this week we are continuing our summer message series on the texts that have touched us. In this series, we are exploring how God has challenged and inspired, uh, sometimes um, uh, comforted, given hope to, and even transformed members of our congregation through passages of Scripture that have come to have special meaning for us. This week, we are looking at two verses from the Old Testament book of Jeremiah that were chosen by one of our elders, Rick Kudruvi. Let's take a look and hear from Rick. Hi, I'm Rick Kudruvi, and the text for today is Lamentations 3, verses 21 to 23. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. Great um, is your faithfulness. Now, you wouldn't know it from that particular passage, but you might guess it from the title. The book of Lamentations is one of the saddest books in the Bible was written in the immediate aftermath of the horrific siege and subsequent destruction of the capital city of Judah, Jerusalem. And the book of Lamentations expresses the profound grief and pain of a person who was actually an eyewitness to all of these terrible events, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Jeremiah was born to a priestly family in the town of Anatote, just a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem, in 650 B.C. He was called to ministry as a prophet in his early 20s, and in his younger years worked very closely (coughs) with one of Judah's best kings, one of uh, really the best kings, Josiah, until Josiah's death in 609 B.C., He was a witness to the decline of the Assyrian Empire and the rise of the Babylonian Empire in its wake. Um, You might remember from last week's message, the northern kingdom of Israel had been destroyed about a century before by the Assyrians, which left the southern kingdom of Judah caught in a confrontation between the great superpowers of the day, Egypt to the south and Babylon to the north and east. Judah bet on the wrong horse in that conflict. It sided with Egypt and as a result of that was uh, pretty much taken over by the Babylonians, although uh, Judah was allowed to exist as kind of a vassal nation as long as the kings of Judah Uh, would agree to uh, give homage to and recognize the legitimacy of the Babylonian Empire as their ruler. Uh, The last king of Israel, a guy by the name of Zedekiah, had promised to do that but uh, decided not to. And um, as a result of that, Babylon's uh, uh, military leader, a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar II, invaded Judah. He surrounded and laid siege to the walled capital city of Jerusalem in 589 B.C. Now that siege, which the city was surrounded, no one could go in, no one could go out. That means no food, no supplies, nothing. That siege lasted 18 months. And conditions inside the city grew more and more desperate as each month passed. The book of Kings dispassionately records that the famine became so severe there was no food for the people. As a matter of fact, uh, archaeologists have done, um, uh, of course, research and, and so on in, in, in the city of Jerusalem, have found uh, homes that dated back to that period of time. They could tell from the archaeological evidence this is exactly what took place. Uh, as a matter of fact, as they, they examined homes from this period of time, they were able to determine that near the end of this siege, people were pretty much eating weeds. 
Uh, the book of Lamentations gives us a glimpse into how gruesome things became, as in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 10, where we read, the hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became food for them. People from the countryside uh, who feared what the Babylonians were going to do to them crammed into the walled city uh, where, of course, people had to drink rationed water and also cook what food, what little food they could find. There was no fuel. They cooked it over their own excrement. Unable to take garbage outside the city, it piled up, and as the garbage piled higher and higher, the cramped conditions and lack of sanitation contributed to the rapid spread of contagious diseases. Jeremiah 9.22 suggests that corpses, uh, which began to pile up, were likely just thrown over the city walls. Say, this is what the Lord declares, dead bodies will lie like dung on the open field, like cut grain before the reaper, with no one to gather them. And then things got really bad. Jerusalem's people, weakened by hunger and disease, had no strength to defend the city. And after 18 months, the city's walls were breached by the Babylonians, and the temple of the Lord, the palace of the king, and all of the houses in Jerusalem were burned to the ground. Large buildings were just pulled down. Jerusalem's women and girls were sexually assaulted by Babylonian soldiers. Her young men were tortured and executed. King Zedekiah, whose alliance with Egypt and refusal to serve Babylon is actually what had precipitated the crisis in the first place, tried to escape, but he was captured by the Babylonians near Jericho, a short distance to, to the east, where he was forced to watch as his sons were murdered in front of him, and then his eyes were gouged out so that their execution would be his last sighted memory. After that, the king was bound and taken into captivity with most of Jerusalem's population. Now, what is astonishing is that that is the historical context in which we find today's text, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now you might wonder, what does that have to do with what is, is going on with all this horrific stuff that's taking place? Let me back up a few verses and put it in uh, its larger context within the biblical canon. Jeremiah writes in Lamentations chapter 3, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. He's describing here the, the profound depression and grief and pain that he feels. Now, I'm going to go back to that in a moment. My soul is downcast within me, because there are two reasons that his soul is downcast. Yet this I call to mind, he writes, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait for quietly for the salvation of the Lord. 
It's good for a person to bear the yoke while he is young. Jeremiah reflects on his people and on his own personal experience during the year and a half siege of Jerusalem. I believe that one of the reasons his soul is downcast is not just because of all of the terrible things that had happened, but his soul is downcast knowing that the entire horrific experience could have been avoided. It did not have to happen. God had called Jeremiah as a prophet to warn Jerusalem what would happen if they continued in their faithlessness as the people of God. Because while they ostensibly worship the Lord in his temple, while they were nominally related to the Lord in a covenant relationship, at the very same time, they were offering child sacrifices to the pagan god Moloch outside of the city walls. They were taking advantage of widows and orphans and the poor to make themselves richer. They were violating the biblically guaranteed rights of the immigrants within their country. They were flagrantly violating the Ten Commandments. They were killing the prophets whom the Lord had called to challenge and to confront them in their evil and call them back to their covenant relationship. It didn't have to happen. Jeremiah 7, as an example, records one of the messages that the Lord had sent Jeremiah to proclaim. This is sometimes called the temple sermon, and you'll see why. Jeremiah delivers it to the people of God in the temple. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Jeremiah proclaims. Reform your ways. And I, Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. I can imagine him saying this through tears. It brought him no joy. He's begging with them. This is what the Lord the Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. Why are those deceptive words? Because they are not living out the covenant with God. They're just relying on a building. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you're, you're trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury that is lying and burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you haven't known and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we're safe. Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. You know, as, as you read that, it may have occurred to you, wow, den of robbers. Jesus used this very text in his own time when the situation was um, pointing in the same direction. You know, when Jesus borrowed this text, it was to warn the people 
of Israel that their faithlessness would ultimately lead to the destruction of the temple of the Lord, another temple, the later temple uh, that had been built under King Herod. The big idea is this, that this horrific national tragedy could have been averted. It didn't have to happen if people had been faithful followers of the Lord and not just nominal believers who called on the name of the Lord, but who in their day-to-day lives ignored his commandments and his instructions about how others are to be treated and about how the Lord is to be acknowledged. And I, I believe that there is a word for us all in this text today. I think it invites us, and listen to this carefully, this text invites us to recognize the part we play in the problems that we have. To recognize the part we play in the problems that we have and to repent. Now, I, I want to remind you of last week's message. Because in last week's message, um, we looked at uh, a, a, tr- a great national tragedy. Um, we also heard from uh, one of the members of our worship team, Leanna Bivens, who had uh, experienced a tragedy to which she and her husband Um, didn't really contribute. They experienced a tragedy, but they didn't cause it. The thing is, sometimes bad things happen because we live in a fallen world. That's the point of Isaiah chapter 55, which we saw last week. Now listen to this. Sometimes, though, bad things happen because we make bad choices. And things will not get better unless and until we acknowledge those bad choices and own them and sincerely repent and ask for forgiveness and then set a new course that is based on God's will, not on ours. The amazing thing is this. When we recognize our role in our problems, and you know, it, it's so easy if, if you're having uh, marriage problems to blame your spouse rather than to look at the role that you play in it. When you're having problems with your kids, to blame it all on them. When there are challenges at work, it's other people's fault. When we look around, it's what, what's happening in our nation or in the world to say it's those people's fault. But when we recognize our own role in the problems that we experience and we personally repent and we set a new course that is based on God's plan for our lives, what happens is we find ourselves in a totally new position, completely new position, which we actually see reflected in Lamentations chapter 3, which is good news. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. We own up to our own stuff. We're not consumed. God loves that when we do it. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, Jeremiah says. That was what gave Jeremiah hope in the midst of this terrible grief and pain that he felt, knowing, knowing that all that had happened could have been avoided. And it is this same hope that we hear in Rick as he shares his story with us this morning. The reason these verses are really important to me is that I grew up in the church and I grew up in an environment that was very legalistic and I never felt like I was good enough. I never felt like I was anything but a terrible sinner. That I just kept over and over falling into temptation and and one day I was reading these verses when my life was coming apart and I realized that 
I get a do-over every day. That while I may need to become sanctified, that was a process and it wasn't my doing, it was God's doing. And that God's mercies were enough for me. And all of a sudden I got the concept of grace as opposed to I could try harder and somehow I would do it. But I realized I was never going to do it. But it was okay. And that changed my life. Because from that point forward, I could relax in God. I could trust in God. I could know that, yeah, I'm going to screw up. I'm with Paul. I'm a great sinner. And if you know any people that know me, ask them. They'll tell you that I screw up plenty. But it's okay. I get a do-over. And God loves me regardless, just like I love my children. And I wouldn't throw them to the curb when they make mistakes, as they have. God loves me even more. In fact, Jesus told me that when I pray, to pray like this, Our Father. God is our Father and loves us more than we can possibly imagine. His steadfast love endures forever. And I can trust in that. And therefore, I now have hope. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope, says Jeremiah. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. See, even, even when the problems and the challenges and even the crises we face are of our own creation. Even then, because of, the, of God's great love, we are not consumed. And why is that? Because his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And, and that's why I think today's text it, it invites us also to, to realize that our hope is in that, in God's great love, in God's unfailing compassion, and in God's great faithfulness. You know, every day, every single day, as we trust ourselves to this truth that God's grace is enough, just trust ourselves that your grace is enough. As we trust that, we get a do-over. No matter what had happened the day before, his mercies are fresh and new every day. Every day of our lives, we're given a new opportunity to enjoy, to experience, to be blessed by the unfailing, all-sufficient, never-ending mercy, provision, and grace of God every single day. You know, um, most of us have, uh, are familiar with or at least have, have heard about this economic uh, principle um, the, the law of supply and demand. I want to use those words supply and demand in a different context and, and in a different way, but I think they're, they're really helpful as we think about how we experience um, Christianity as followers of Jesus Christ because I, I think there are two ways to do it. And I think the Bible says clearly that one of them um, isn't helpful and actually misses the point. Far too many of us as Christians, focus on the demand side of religion. I got to do this. It's all on me. I've got to try harder. I'm screwing up. I got to do better. Why can't I get this? And you know what? Every time we think that way, it just makes matters worse. God's grace on the other hand, is all about not our inadequate supply. It is God's grace is all about God's unfailing, all-sufficient, never-ending supply of love and compassion and power and faithfulness that is new every morning, fresh every day, and available to us. So as one person put it, you know, we ought to wake up every morning being supply-focused, not demand-focused. And that is the good news. That is the good news. In fact, 
The word good is used three times in a row in verses uh, 25 through 27. It's not just used three times in a row. It is the first word of uh, every sentence in the original Hebrew. It's the word tov, 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 tov. The Lord is good, or in the Hebrew order, good is the Lord to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. Good it is. I know it sounds like Uh, Yoda when I read it in the Hebrew order, but it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Look at that. Waiting on God, waiting on the Lord, seeking him. It's not about trying harder. It's no accident that we find this bright passage in the very center of the book of Lamentations. The book of Lamentations, by the way, is just fascinating in Hebrew. We're required as you know, pastors to, to study uh, Hebrew at, at seminary, and I think it's for a good reason. You know, you look at the book of Hebrews, uh, or the book of Lamentations in Hebrew, it's really interesting. It's got five chapters in it. The first four chapters, chapter one, each, there are 22 uh, verses, and each one of them begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order. Chapter 2, exactly the same pattern. Chapter 3, almost the same pattern. It's got uh, three times as many verses. Why is that? Because it's got AAA, BBB, CCC, and so on. Chapter 4, the, the very same way. Now, in Hebrew poetry this is, and, and Hebrew literature, this is really important because what happens is, you know, when we write stuff, like people write a screenplay for a movie, you know how we save the main point for the very end? It's kind of like the climax and the conclusion, and that's where the point is. In, in Hebrew literature, it's almost always in the center. So it sort of builds up to the main point, and then it goes down from, from there. The book of Lamentations is just like that. What's the point it's all building up to? The goodness of God. Great is his mercy, his faithfulness. It's fresh every day. That's why it is no accident that we find this bright passage right smack dab in the book of Lamentations. It is the centerpiece of this sad book because it highlights this central truth of faith, that God is uh, is present in the midst of our darkness and pain. Even that which is the darkness of our own creation. And that's why we are invited in this text today to remember who God is and to rest in his grace. Remember who God is and rest in his grace. One of the things that the prophet Jeremiah had told the people of Israel, look, if you guys do not repent, you're going to lose the land. But then there was good news beyond that. That will only be for 70 years, and then you'll return. Great is God's faithfulness. So hope in the Lord, he says, seek him. Wait quietly for God's salvation. Someone here today needs to hear this word of the Lord. Suffering does not last forever challenge that you might be facing right now, the pain that you might be going through, the grief that you are experiencing doesn't last forever, even if it seems hopeless. I think that the death and resurrection of of Jesus reminds us that not even death itself is able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord, that not even Death, our sin, the sin of others, and not even death itself can separate us from the love of God. So hope in the Lord. Seek him. Wait quietly for God's salvation. You know, it is true. Suffering doesn't last forever. Every problem has a limited lifespan. But there is one thing that is eternal. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. God's great love, his unfailing compassion, his great faithfulness is eternal. It never stops flowing. It is fresh every morning. When you woke up this morning, God was present with an infinite available 
never-ending supply of mercy and grace. We, all we do is acknowledge the part that we play in our own problems and the part that we play in the problems in the world around us. And we turn from that and turn toward God and then rest in his grace. It's fresh every morning. And that means, by the way, that the way back to God is open to anyone who would take it. If you're kind of teetering on the edge about wondering if you know, I could be a Christian after what I've done, if you're sitting here as a follower of Christ, but know that you're kind of like those guys to whom uh, Jeremiah was speaking in the temple of Jerusalem, that on the one level we're nominal Christians, we're ostensible believers, but on, on another way we're kind of practicing atheists, or at least they're parts of our lives that would not stand up to scrutiny, uh, not just of the Lord, but of other people and even our own conscience. The way back to God is open to anyone who would take it, no matter what. No matter what. Great is his faithfulness.